welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. We interview remarkable and thought-provoking guests about innovation, leadership, and change in the world of business. Whether you're an executive or an entrepreneur, our objective is to help you and your organization create an entrepreneurial culture, become more innovative, and better able to respond to change. Each week, we'll deconstruct world-class performance from the arenas of business, academia, science, and sports. Each week, you can expect key insights, fresh perspectives, and proven tools you can use straight away to make you more successful professionally and personally. With your host, Mark Bidwell. Hello, this is Mark Bidwell. Welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. If this is your first time listening, a very warm welcome. Now, we founded Innovation Ecosystems in order to help individuals and companies become more open to multiple perspectives and to deliver them those multiple perspectives in a range of formats. And as a listener to this podcast, you'll know that we discuss the topics of innovation, change and leadership with world-class performers from the worlds of business, academia, sports, science and the arts. And over the course of the last two and a half years, we've been fortunate enough to attract a wide variety of guests onto the show, all of whom have given us the benefits of the unique perspectives that they bring to the world. And at the end of each of our interviews, I ask our guests three questions. The first question, what have you changed your mind about recently, is designed to encourage guests to reflect on their unconscious biases and the extent to which they are able to overcome them based on new data in order to take their thinking in new directions. And this is a key skill for leaders, and you can listen to the responses from a wide range of the season four guests in episode 75. This week's episode focuses on the second question that I ask guests relating to the personal work habits and routines that they use in order to remain fresh, creative and consistently to perform at a high level. We are, after all, all creatures of habit and unless we proactively seek out fresh perspectives, we run the risk of remaining in our own personal bubbles, surrounded by people who think the same way and falling victims to the perils of groupthink, confirmation bias, availability bias, to name but a few of these challenges that we face in the workplace. So let's start with a great example from a senior corporate executive at an industry leading company talking about how he critiques a PowerPoint presentation in service of improving the end product. This practice often yields breakthroughs or failing that incremental small i innovations which he talked about at length in our interview. Specifically, he discusses how he leverages his predisposition for worry and for stress to raise the performance of his colleagues. Mark, I'm a professional worrier, meaning I stress about all the little details and issues around execution and producing activities. And, you know, I think um, maybe someone could say that's neurotic, but I think that um, I try and channel that to intensively ripping apart everything that we are planning to do and look for the shortfalls and the problems. That was Andy Billings, Vice President of Profitable Creativity at Electronic Arts. You know, if we have a 10-page deck, we'll have a 25-page critique of the deck or the program. So we just kind of find that helps not get complacent, helps us not get overly confident in our material. We just always go looking for the problems, the issues, how that thing can maybe not work out, how might it not be as exciting or dynamic or have the impact that we want. We think about if people are going to have reservations about it, what would they be? If someone's going to critique it, what would we be? So we spent a huge amount of time doing that. And then when we finish something, we really go deep on that. And we'll spend literally hours and hours as a group going, you know, what do we like? didn't we like? What could be better? How would we change? And then we generate a whole new set of ideas. You know, again, kind of either both the incremental ideas and then, uh, gee, what if we did something completely different and completely blew that up and went in a different direction? So that's a personal practice. Has a little wear and tear on it for the operator, but does kind of keep us on our toes and always improving. So Andy Billings there talking about rooting out the shortfalls and problems and in doing so, creating new ideas and opportunities from the humble PowerPoint. And as an aside, here in Switzerland, there's actually a political party called the Anti-PowerPoint Party dedicated to decreasing professional use of presentation software. 
and the party claims that um, use over reliance on on PowerPoint presentations causes national economic damage am amounting to two point one billion francs a year and lowers the quality of a presentation in ninety five percent of all cases. And of course, in many companies, PowerPoint is a fact of life. And Andy's approach to how he challenges presentations is a wonderful example of how both incremental and breakthrough ideas can come from the humble PowerPoint deck. Now, making the most of good opportunities and shunning potentially bad opportunities, as you'd expect, is a pretty good rule to live by, both in business and in life. But Scott Anthony, who's a writer, speaker, and managing partner at consulting firm Innersight, told me in episode 58 that even if the opportunity doesn't make any rational sense, it might be worth some deeper consideration nonetheless. I'm proud of the fact that I've done that a few times in my career, and I think it has made me who I am. So as an example of this, what I'm studying at Harvard Business School in 2000, Clay Christensen is one of my professors. I intellectually fall in love with the ideas that he has. He says midway through the class, hey, I've got some money to hire a researcher. It's not as much as you'd make if you went and did anything else, but, you know, it'd be an interesting experience. You know, I could have gone back to the company I worked at before business school, McKinsey and Company. I had a job offer to go work strategy for American Express, both short term, much more lucrative offers. But I said, why not? You know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And here I am. And coming out to Asia in 2010, uh, taking the role in 2009, moving out here in 2010. It wasn't fully rational. Uh, my wife had never been out here. We had two young kids and, you know, I disrupted myself and doing a very different type of business. But why not? You know, <laughs> yep. you, you got to try. Nothing, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So the, um, uh, that, that has been something that I'm grateful that I, I have done that and had people who will support me doing that as well. Yeah, I got very lucky that it's all worked out. So that was Scott Anthony speaking in episode 58, in which he talked in depth about how his experience in Asia has really changed how he thinks about business and capitalism in general and the role played in it by family-owned businesses and governmental organisations. Now, when we embrace opportunities, it doesn't always have to lead to big, life-changing moments. Sometimes just spotting the small opportunities, or the gaps, as David Pearl put it in episode 52, can make all the difference. What I do is I practice street wisdom in a corridor. So I'm not always in the street, but when I'm in, as I am at the moment, in a, in a big skyscraper somewhere in a financial district or whatever, when I go between one thing and another, so when we finish and I go into something else, I'll try and notice that 30 seconds and try and recharge, reconnect, breathe, you know, go back to neutral, if you like, get a bit of an impulse from the outside and then move on. So I, I would say in broadly is, is seize the gap. So let me just say a little bit about David Pearl and the movement that he created, uh, which is called Street Wisdom. And he describes Street Wisdom as a powerful, innovative tool that helps reboot thinking, set new directions and unlock ideas, essentially teaching individuals to use the city streets to find fresh answers to the questions on their mind. Street Wisdom really helps your business solve tough problems and get fresh new ideas. Now, the principle behind Street Wisdom has been echoed by many previous guests, and this is one of the reasons that I believe the movement has, uh, that he started is active in, in over 30 countries now. And I often hear about companies sending their executives to places like Silicon Valley to do some inno innovation tourism. And even if they don't bump into their competitors, the likelihood is that they might well be doing the same kind of thing. And as a, this echoes what we heard from a very early guest, Rob Walcott, who's Professor of Innovation at Kellogg Business School. He said that if you're going to the same conferences as your competitors and if you're going to the talking to the same people as your competitors and using the same suppliers and hiring from the same pools as your competitors, then you're probably finding some of the same answers as your competitors as well. So why not look a little bit closer to home and start on the streets that surround your office? That's the promise um, of street wisdom. Now, like David Pearl, in episode 61, my guest Tyler Gage talked about something similar to spotting the gap. Although Tyler's approach was more around prolonging the gap until both mind and body are ready to do battle with the day. So one that I find very important, which is quite simple in my daily practice, is not looking at my phone when I wake up for at least 30 or 40 minutes. Seems very simple, but I find that giving my body, my mind, at least a little bit of time to not jump immediately into technological world and fluttering emails. I find that the 
mindset that puts me in for the day carries me from start to finish. And that when I immediately look at blue light emails and my mind jumps from, you know, what is ultimately a sensitive sort of dream resting space, you know, zero to a hundred, it creates just a certain level of stress in my system that is really not worth it. (laughs) So um, it's something I think is extremely easy to do. It just takes fending off the anxiety of looking at emails and what happened and what I have to do today for even 30 or 40 minutes. And for those of you not familiar with Tyler's story, he established and built out a very fast growing natural energy drinks company that's going head to head with established players like uh, Monster Energy, sourcing not just raw materials, but also business insight um, from the Peruvian rainforest. And Tyler's developed practices to filter out distractions and to ease into each day in a way that maximizes the likelihood of him getting the outcomes he's looking for. And over time, the benefits of creating this space at the beginning of the day will compound. Now here's another practice that those of us who travel a lot can perhaps benefit from. I had the fortune of traveling a lot. So when I go to different cities, I used to, um, when I first started traveling, I would go someplace, airport, hotel, sleep, wake up, speak, airport, fly out. And um, it quickly became a sterile, I mm-hmm. guess. Mm-hmm. And so now I always have what I call my plus one, where I would say, well, where can I go here? Physical places for some reason, like there's a statue or a battlefield or a museum. And, you know, in my sort of engineer mind, I'm, I'm always drawn to the, you know, the Natural History Museum or something, mm-hmm. you know, yep. something yep. like that. Uh, but I would try and do something, uh, something different. Now, for those of you who don't know, David Marquet is a former captain of the nuclear submarine USS Santa Fe. So visiting statues or battlefields is something that you might expect. But what you might not expect is the second part to his answer. Children's books, I think, are a, a good source <laughs> of inspiration they, because they, they have a high degree of integrity and there's a simplification and honesty to them. Now, as a parent, I read quite a lot of children's books to my kids, and I'm always on the lookout for authors who write not just for children, but also for adults. So David's comment resonated with me. And a couple of examples, in case you're interested, are uh, Ian Fleming, um, who, who wrote the childhood classic Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, as well as the James Bond series, and Wayne Dyer, author of a number of um, great personal development books, like Your Erroneous Zones, as well as children's books like Unstoppable Me and No Excuses. Now, David makes a really important point here about the need to break out of our existing routines. For example, I'd love um, an Amazon recommendation engine that pointed me towards completely different books versus recommending more of the same. The other point about museums really resonated. Previous guest uh, Caroline Webb in episode 36 described taking a group of executives to the National Portrait Gallery in London to help them look at a business problem in a completely different way. And I'm reminded about a quote um, by George Lewis, described by Business Week as the original Mr. Big Idea, who has had a titanic influence on world culture. And he claims that some of his best ideas have come while meandering through the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he describes museums as the custodians of epiphanies. Something to think about, perhaps. Now, as well as unexpected answers, we also get answers that are directly opposed to one another. What works for one person or company is unimaginable to another. We're now going to hear an example of that. Consistency in routine versus unpredictability in chance. And on the side of consistency and routine, we're going to hear from Brad Feld. But first, his best-selling author and award-winning journalist and co-founder and director of research at the Flow Genome Project, Stephen Kotler. I really believe, really, really fervently believe two things, which is that when spending around all these people who do the impossible, they understand that as long as they commit, they're willing to be a little uncomfortable every day, right? I'm willing to get up at four o'clock in the morning and be a little tired, and I'm going to face an empty page for four hours, no matter what else happens. And the worst thing that could happen is I'm going to be uncomfortable. My writing is going to suck. I'm going to be pissed at myself, frustrated, whatever, right? But I'm just willing to do it over and over and over again. And I think that's consistent with most super successful people I know. They're just willing to be uncomfortable consistently. 
Now that comment reminds me of Woody Allen's quote that 99% of success in life is just showing up. And still in the consistency and routine camp, here's Brad Feld, who's an entrepreneur, author and venture capitalist. I try to write every single day. I blog probably 20 out of 30, 31 days a month. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I probably don't make every single day. But between my blogging and my working on books, and when I say write, I don't mean emails and I don't mean memos. I mean mm -hmm. sitting down and, and concentrating on a thought and writing. And on the flip side of that approach, I don't really have much routine in what I do. I know that a lot of a lot of books, a lot of uh, approaches will tell you you need to have routine, you need to have habits. I have try to break those. Author, speaker, and entrepreneur Franz Johansson. The more interesting question for me is how do I choose to spend the next sort of couple of hours of the day to increase the number of unusual perspectives? So, for instance, maybe one day I walk to the subway. I live in New York City. Maybe the next I take a car. Maybe the next I'm walking. I'm, I'm choosing to, we have a, our office on the 26th floor. I take the elevator to 23rd floor and then I walk up three floors. And what, what this is all doing is, is exposing me to new perspectives, new insights. I'm running into people that I would not otherwise have met. For me, it is actively looking for intersections, actively saying, where can I learn new things? So Franz has a routine to do things differently in the knowledge that he will expose himself to different stimuli and spot new patterns and make new connections. Now, like Franz, many of my guests talked about putting themselves in new situations and, and fresh surroundings in order to find new perspectives and to become more effective. And this is also true of my guest on episode 70. Every once in a while, you'll just get something and you'll never would have gotten it had you sat in your office and not traveled or not got on the plane or not made the phone call. Author, investment strategist, portfolio manager and biographer to Warren Buffett, Robert Hagstrom. So oftentimes, you know, I go to many conferences and try to stay very engaged in my discipline. You know, sometimes I walk away and I got nothing. You know, it's like I know that or I've already heard that or that's nothing new. Um, you've got to continue to cast, uh, you know, as I say in the book, you know, it, 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 John Holland talks about, you know, the way in which you get really smart about these things is that, you know, you got to continue to sprout out into different directions and stay very engaged. And he talked about, you know, the, the Norwegian fishermen, you know, they, they would, they would fish out the school that they had, had located, but they'd also always send a trawler or a fishing boat in a different direction each day because mm -hmm. uh, you never know what they would find and, you know, something new and something different. So it's a process that you've got to stay engaged with the world. World. You've got to stay engaged with your peers. You've got to stay in, engaged with your profession, for sure. Something will always pop up somewhere along the way, even though 90% of the time you go, geez, this is a waste. Um, I'm not learning anything. But every once in a while, you'll get that nugget, and it can make a big difference. And in the interview with Robert, we discussed his book, Lattice Work, which is all about learning from different disciplines, such as biology, physics, psychology, philosophy and applying some of the main models of those disciplines to, in his case, investment management. Now, getting up and getting out of the office in all its various forms was a popular response to this question across Series 4. Now, here are two quite different takes on that. We're going to hear from Whitney Johnson, who's an author, a speaker, executive and innovation coach. But first, we go to Luis Perez Breva, who's a lecturer and research scientist at MIT School of Engineering and the director of MIT's innovation teams. I take all my conversations while walking, absolutely all of them, typically in the street, even if it's snowing. So every time I have a phone call, obviously not today, today we're sitting over Skype, but every time I have a phone call, I'm actually walking in the street. And, and it helps me think a lot. It helps me exercise as well. But most important, it actually helps me in touch with the real world. Otherwise, I'm just stuck in an office. So whenever possible, every single phone call, I'm taking it in the street, taking a stroll, not far away from the office, right? But just taking a stroll. And I think it makes me more effective because I factor in what I'm talking, I'm thinking. And thinking is something it's really hard to do when you are sitting in your office, going through the motions of your email and so many other things that hit us every single second. So here's Lewis killing two birds with one stone, making calls while exercising, but also recognizing some of the shortcomings of his office environment and adapting his habits accordingly. And now let's go to Whitney, an early guest on the podcast, who came back recently to talk about her new book. The other way that I get new ideas is, you're going to laugh, when I commit to go do something, I show up to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. For example, just a couple of weeks ago, one of my friends, Liz Wiseman, who wrote the book Multipliers, had 
arranged for us to take a tour of the Tesla factory, right? Tesla. And I almost didn't go because I thought, oh, I've got to prepare my remarks for the next day. I've been on the road for a week and a half. I don't have time, blah, 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 blah. But I committed to go and I'm really trying, if I make a commitment to show up. Well, when I went, it was astonishing. It was like this, this plant, the, there were transformers. They looked like transformers, these robots that are building the, the cars. There was a stamping press that's like the several 747s who are stamping the panels of the machine. I just, I felt this sense of awe and I would call it almost religious awe of just this idea that had come from the mind of a human being and now many human beings that are creating this beautiful machine. And after I came out of there, I was like, just think if I hadn't gone, if I hadn't kept my word, all of these ideas, all of these thoughts, all of these learnings, none of them would have happened. Whilst going out and seeing new things and exposing yourself to inspiration in all its forms is clearly worthwhile. The last guest in this wrap-up episode prefers to reduce the amount of stimuli that he's exposed to, and it's that that creates the conditions for innovation for him. I feel that too many of us, me included, have been in a state of semi-distraction in our day-to-day -day life. So many stimuli, so many things to read, so many tweets and Facebook mm -hmm. things. And is it any wonder that that kind of suppresses, I think, real creativity and innovation. Writer, speaker and entrepreneur Gib Bullock. There's no shortage of places out there like mm. your podcast, which is excellent. I think we are, there's no shortage of these of stimuli, if you will, if we want to look for them. My answer to this would be a different one, is that I actually try and go into myself or go mm. to a quiet place where you can actually shut out some of these things. Yep. Nothing against what you're doing with innovation ecosystem. There's a time for that. But when I get myself to a very quiet place, it might be somewhere on a far away, you know, island or Bali or something like that, if I can, and just cut off mm. and be still, then I actually find it pays huge dividends in terms of creativity and ideas and thoughts and new perspectives without having to read anything, without having to listen to anything yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's, the ideas are probably will bubble up if you can get quiet enough. So Gibbs' book, The Entrepreneur, Confessions of a Corporate Insurgent, was set in a mental health ward in Scotland, and it's well worth a read. So we've highlighted a number of very different practices and routines that our guests use to remain fresh and creative and to access diversity and multiple perspectives. And just because they work for them doesn't mean that they're going to work for you. Things like reading children's books, visiting museums, getting really present in the moment, tapping into the wisdom of the street, getting off the elevator a couple of floors early, are all things that you can do. They're easy to do, but they're also easy not to do. And as we know from the work that we do it's with, with organisations, it's a small eye innovations that compound over time, and that by recombining ideas from multiple domains and different perspectives, you can create new solutions to your business problems. And while all of us can, can build our innovation muscles by doing some simple exercises like the ones we've talked about, it does take discipline. And like exercise and like healthy eating, the benefits build up over time. And I suspect I'm not alone in overestimating what I can achieve in the short term and underestimating what we can achieve in the long term. So bear that in mind next time you have the opportunity to expose yourself to a fresh perspective, be it on your daily commute, how you spend your time on a business trip, or what you choose to read when you have some free time. Now, I hope you found this second season four wrap-up episode to be of value. And until next time, have a great week. This is Mark Bidwell, Changing Perspectives, one podcast at a time.